historically one of the best protections of the value of money against the inroads of political spending was the gold standard, the redemption of money in gold on demand. This put a check rein on the politician, Warren Randolph Burgess. Hello and welcome back. Let's continue our journey with the valiant Hidalgo and his governing squire. Chapter 45 of Don Quixote Part 2 relates three legal cases that Sancho must decide upon assuming power on the Isle of Barataria. The symbolic continuity between these cases reveals Cervantes' concern for the Habsburg inflationary monetary policy, which was diminishing the purchasing power of the common coin of Castile. This destructive power of inflation is also the essential meaning of the adventure of the cats in chapter 46. Finally, we shall see that chapter 47 is a summary, a meditation on political corruption in general, although again, with particular emphasis on fiscal matters. As usual, the details make all of this complicated. Remember that Don Quixote Part II is a political quagmire. At times, Sancho will display brilliance and moral rectitude, but the symbolism and the ironies of his rule are problematic and ominous from beginning to end. The narrator opens this sequence with a parodic apostrophe to Apollo that hints at the global reach of the Spanish Empire. This is followed by a description of the new governor's formal investiture with much pomp they took him to the main cathedral and gave thanks to God, and then with some ridiculous ceremonies, they gave him the keys to the city. Adding to this mockery of political power, when Sancho sits on his throne, the narrator reminds us that the governor cannot read. Sancho contemplates writing on the wall opposite him, and since he did not know how to read, he asked what those marks were painted there on the wall. This refers to the doomed King Belshazzar in Daniel chapter five. Recall that the words Daniel reads for the Babylonian king are monetary weights and measures, which Daniel then interprets as verbs to mean that the king's days have been measured, that he has been weighed and found lacking, and that his kingdom will be divided among his enemies. In other words, the allusion to Daniel via the writing on the wall across from Sancho is itself already an allusion to deceptive monetary policy as blasphemous and doomed rule. Did you know the earliest literary reference to monetary manipulation is found in Aristophanes' The Frogs, 405 BC? In Sancho's case, the writing is relatively harmless. The Duke's Majordomo reads, today on such and such day of such and such month of the year such and such, Sir Don Sancho Panza took control of this isle and may he enjoy it many years to come. As elsewhere, humility is Sancho's saving grace. He reacts against the idea that he should carry a title. I have no Don, nor has anyone in my entire lineage ever had one. So Sancho begins his rule by following Don Quixote's advice to the letter against the arrogance of hierarchical and ethnic privilege. Sancho's first case involves a tailor who cheats a peasant. There are two allusions to anti-Semitism here. First, the tailor apologizes for his profession associated with Jews and conversos and admits that the farmer's haggles with him were motivated by the poor reputation of tailors. Second, the farmer gives the tailor some cloth and requests that he make him a pointed cap, which possibly alludes to the caps worn by victims of the Inquisition. However, the essence of the story involves the quantity of cloth used and the number of caps produced. The peasant keeps insisting that more caps be produced from the same amount of cloth, and the tailor's response is to produce a handful of tiny caps. Note how this tale reflects the effect of monetary inflation. The amount and quality of goods available for a given price depreciate to reflect the decreased purchasing power of an artificially weakened currency. You experience something similar when canned goods and candy bars get smaller instead of going up in price. Sancho rules that the peasant loses his cloth and that the tailor loses the cost of his labor. In other words, everyone loses when quantities and measures are changed. 
Cervantes takes a final jab at government in general when Sancho also rules that the tiny caps be donated to prisoners who no doubt will find them useless. Sancho's second case continues the monetary theme of the first. Here we have a creditor and a debtor. The creditor wants his money back, but the debtor swears he has already paid him. One moral of this tale is that when you loan somebody money, you should have a contract and witnesses. But the deeper point is that monetary deception favors debtors over creditors. Quixotic Mission. When money loses its purchasing power, who benefits? A. Creditors. B. Speculators. C. Debtors. Correct answer. C. Debtors. This explains Sancho's Solomon-like perception that the debtor is hiding the loaned money in his cane. The debtor swears by the cross on Sancho's staff that he has returned the money to his creditor, but Sancho reasons that he makes this oath because before doing so, he handed his cane to the creditor, thus technically returning the money. But the mystery is actually deeper. Cervantes is criticizing the Habsburg King's monetary shenanigans. The creditor lent the debtor gold coins, that is, not the more adulterated copper coins. The phrase used to describe the amount of the loan highlights the importance of pure money. Ten escudos of gold in gold refers to gold coins valued at 13 reales as opposed to the more common escudo valued at 11 reales. The escudo of gold was rare precisely because it contained more gold, and so the episode indicates that Cervantes understood Gresham's law, whereby good money disappears in the presence of bad money. Careful readers will also note that despite Sancho's discovery of the hidden gold, the creditor still loses the time value of his money, so the moral is doubly complicated. When you loan somebody money, you must attend to the composition of the coins used to pay you back, but you also need to charge interest. On one hand, the case illustrates Gresham's law because the better gold coins have been removed from circulation. On the other hand, the case criticizes laws against usury because they favor debtors. In other words, also on trial here are the Habsburgs who constantly debased coins to their benefit and Catholic authorities who clung to the old view that charging interest for a loan was somehow immoral. That's all for now. Find out what happens with our characters in our next discussion of this fascinating text. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.